This is Join Us in France, episode 461. 461. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France. Everyday life in France, great places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy, and news related to travel to France. Today, I bring you a conversation with Elise Riven of Toulouse Guided Walks about some of the most glorious libraries in France, including La Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Richelieu. We usually call it BNF Richelieu, BNF standing for Bibliothèque Nationale de France. This podcast is supported by donors and listeners who buy my tours and services, including my itinerary consult service, my GPS self-guided tours of Paris on the Voice Map app, or take a day trip with me around the southwest of France in my electric car. You can browse all of that at my boutique, joinusinfrance.com for a slash boutique. And I just added a few possible day trips with Annie. These are just suggestions I think would be fantastic, but perhaps you have some other ideas. This is, after all, a completely custom day trip. For the magazine part of the podcast, after the interview, I'll discuss the opening ceremonies of the Olympics and the controversial hijab ban in France. Bonjour, Elise. Bonjour, Annie. We are going to talk about one of our favorite things. We did an episode a few weeks back about bookstores in France of famous, beautiful, engaging bookstores and also villages where there are books and places where they have book fairs. And of course, when we do these sorts of episodes, you have to understand that these are never exhaustive, okay? We never list all of them because sometimes somebody emails me and says, oh, but you didn't mention this. I'm like, right. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there has to be a choice made because podcasts only can last a certain amount of minutes. Yes, I think you'd grow roots. I would probably. My behind is actually big enough. I don't need to do that. But no, truthfully, you're absolutely right. This is to give a sampling of things. Yes. Give you some ideas of the biggies, the best ones. So today we are going to talk about several places. We'll start with telling you a little bit about what you can see there, what you can do there when you go, and also then the history of these beautiful bibliothèques. And in French, a bibliothèque is a library, like a public library. And a bookstore is not, is a librairie. Okay, so it's a faux ami. You have to keep them straight in your head. That's just how it is. So Elise, take it away. Tell us about these places. Well, there are four, very particularly in Paris, that are really, really important. And let's start with the one that is physically the biggest. And that is the French National François Mitterrand Bibliothèque. François Mitterrand was president of France for 12 years, starting in 1981. And like many, many presidents, he wanted to create a monument that would be left, I think, a little bit in his glory. He was also a relatively intellectual person. And so he decided, since it was actually needed, that it was time to build a new library. And what was built, and it's on the, what's called the Quai François Mauriac, which is right near the Jardin des Plantes, at the extreme eastern edge of the 6th arrondissement, is a monumental four-building structure. It is humongous, and it is in the shape of four books that are actually, it's like bookends around a central garden. And it is enormous. It's got millions and millions and millions of documents. It's got a part that's open to the public. It's got a part that's, of course, only for research. It has temporary exhibits, which I've been to. I've been to two there. It has a garden in the center. It's really quite impressive. Right. It's a very modern building. And it's, what, 22 stories 22 tall? 22 stories, yes. We'll talk about it a little bit later. It's really humongous. I mean, it's beyond the when we talk about square meters or square feet of something, I mean, most of the time those numbers are, oh, really? Okay, it looks like a lot. It's big. Each of the buildings is 22 stories high. It holds the largest collection of documents, including objects as well, that any library could possibly have in France. Right. And so I have driven past it because I have cousins who live nearby 
but I have never been inside. What is it like? Well, there are parts that are open to the public that are reading rooms. It's not impressive in the sense that it's not 17th century architecture with gorgeous decoration. It's really accessible and modern. It wasn't completed and open to the public until 1996. So we're talking about really a very, very modern structure, but it's easy to use. That's what makes it really important in terms of the fact that it's open to the public and also that it has some very interesting exhibits. It has an exhibit space, so it has temporary exhibits that have to do with writing, with writers, with books and documents and things like that. So I like going there, actually. Sounds good. Yeah, I should try it. I have time if I run out of stuff to do in Paris. Well, that would be a good I, you one. Know, since you are my go-to the Jardin des Plantes person. Yes, I love the Jardin des Plantes. So all you do is just go right across. Yeah. Yes, it's across the river from there. It's No, it's across the road, practically. It's on the same side. It's on the same side of the river. Yeah, I get turned around that river. It's like, what bank am I on? <laughs> well, actually, for anybody taking one of those river boats that goes all the way, you know, that goes up and down the Seine, if I remember correctly, if you get that far east, you know, on the north side, it's Bercy, it's the 12th arrondissement. Right. And right there, you where you sort of turn, the boat turns around, you get to see them. It looks like four huge bookends, you know, standing up there. Okay. You know? It's not aesthetic from the outside, for unless you're really into straight very modern architecture. It's more what's on the inside that counts. Okay. Okay. But thankfully, there are way better looking ones in Paris. Yes. And we're going to get to those now. Yes. So the second one is the Mazarin Library, which is actually on the left bank. It's right on the Seine. Actually, the two of them are both right on the Seine. And it is Mazarin was a man who was one of the prime ministers under Louis XIII, he was an intellectual. He was a nasty man, but he was an intellectual. And the building is from the end of the 17th century. It is absolutely magnificent. It is now part of what's called the Institut Francaise. And it has a very important, very illustrious collection of ancient books and documents. Right. So picture yourself on the Pont des Arts. Behind, those of you who've taken my voice map tour, you walk right past it. On the Pont des Arts, my voice map tour starts on the side of the Louvre. And the first thing I do is I take you across. When you're on the other side of the Pont des Arts, ahead of you is l'Institut de France. So that's where the Académie Française meets. That's where a lot of these scientific organizations meet. And there is the Bibliothèque Mazarin. It's not very large. I've been inside. You can walk through it. You just go through security. They have limited hours, but you can check that on their website. And because it changes, so I don't want to tell you and then, yeah. But you can look inside. It is not the prettiest one, but it's very nice. I thought, actually thought that it looks nice. I mean, it's not as beautiful as Rochelle, but it's still beautiful. It's a building. It is a gorgeous mansion with this curved magnificent frontage, you know, and it's absolutely gorgeous with its limestone. And it is a mansion from the end of the 17th century, after all. Yes, yes, yes. So you go inside, you look around, there are people working there. You may not occupy one of the tables because that's for people who have reserved a seat in advance and who have the credentials. You have to have a research project, pretty much, or be a professor to be able to use these facilities as, you know, to sit there and do research. Yeah, if you're a student working on a thesis or something like that, you can go. Yes, but me just saying, oh, I have my laptop. I'd like to sit here and work. No, no, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the Mazarin, very close to, I mean, the city center. It's across from the Samaritaine. The Pont Neuf is right there. It's around the corner from the L'École de Beaux-Arts de Paris. It's a little section right at the extreme western side of the 6th arrondissement where you have these gorgeous buildings that are a lot of them from the 17th century. And it's really quite elegant right there. Right. And you also have La Monnaie de Paris right there that you can visit as well. I think for that you pay a little bit and you can visit. It's like a... I don't know. I mean, they don't make, they don't print money there, but I don't know what they do. I think they still do. Oh. I think they, they still print something there. I know it was just recently, I saw an exhibit there. Something is still done there, but I'm not sure exactly what, but not enough for people to have big 
there's no heist that's going to happen there. No Casa de Papel happening there. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't worry about it. Listen, I'm watching this in Spanish. I, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> that was really <laughs> They talk first. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. They do. They do indeed. Yeah. So anyway, the Mazarin Library is fantastic. Recommended if you're in the area, as well as the uh, Monet de Paris. And my voice map tours, by the way. It's oh, of good. course. Pretty of good. Course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and the, the third one, which I know is your baby favorite at this point, and that is the BNF uh, Richelieu. Oh, yes. That one is amazing. Yeah. That is another. Richelieu was another man who was the equivalent of prime minister and the what is called the regime. And that was built actually in the late 1600s. It's Rue Vivienne, which is it's right next to the Galerie Vivienne, the covered gallery that we've actually talked about. And behind the Palais Royal, it is a magnificent building that houses a collection of books, documents, and other objects that all have to do with the arts and music and maps and coins and science and things like that. And it spent years being closed while they were renovating it and has just recently been reopened. And that was the one you visited. Right. So that one is absolutely beautiful. I understand if you've been to Paris, if you're just going to Paris for the first time, perhaps you're not going to take the time to go visit the BNF. But if you've been to Paris before, you really need to stop at the BNF. It is gorgeous. It's very central because it's probably, what, 10 minute walk from the Louvre? Yeah. It's, so you have the Louvre, Palais Royal, and then you have the BNF in that area. And so BNF, you can visit. You do need a ticket. I think it's 12 euros or 14 euros or something like that. Well worth the entrance fee. And you go inside and you look around. And I'm going to tell you the rooms and what you can see in them. You can also book a guided tour, but those sell out a lot. Now, this is something that you can, you need two hours to do it justice and don't leave it till the end of the day because it, I think it closes at six most days. It closes at, no, actually, the latest information I had was that Tuesday through Saturday, it actually closes at eight o'clock. Huh. And it's closed Mondays. So it's closed to the public and Sunday it's only open in the afternoon. Right. So check the times because it doesn't stay, you know, open. Yeah, it, it must be summer hours or something. In the winter, I think it's six. Anyway, do make the time for it. It's beautiful. So what are you going to see in there? The main room is called Salle La Brousse. It's the reading room. And again, they're not going to let you sit there with your iPad, okay? This is for researchers and people who have reserved the room. But you have, it's just visually beautiful. I'm going to use the photos to illustrate this episode. You have monumental domes columns, ironwork. It is named after Pierre-François-Henri Labrouste, who was the architect who designed this and other libraries. Just a beautiful room. You walk around with your mouth agape. <laughs> it's so beautiful. The other place is called La Salle des Manuscrits. So this is a collection of medieval and modern manuscripts in various languages, various disciplines. You will see treasures like the Très Riches Heures du Duc de Berry, which is illuminated, hand-painted, massive books, beautiful stuff. It's one of the most valuable ones that we still have. And then the, another room is La Salle des Cartes et Plans. So it's maps and plans, the differences. Map is more geographic. And plan is like a city street kind of thing. I mean, it's work or it could be plans of structures, things that are being built. Okay. Yeah. So a bunch of those and they go from ancient maps to, you know, modern geospatial type stuff. The famous Plan de Turgot is a detailed map of Paris that was commissioned by Louis XV is one of the highlights there, but there's some beautiful stuff. And they display quite a few things, obviously, at any one time. They have more, so they rotate the collections, just like all museums do. I read that they do have temporary exhibits regularly. They probably do, yes. Yes. The Cabinet des Médailles, so this is the Department of Coins, Medals and Antiques. They have lots of coins, medals, gems, artifacts that date back to the antiquity. Among the treasures is the Cameo of Augustus and the Cup of Ptolemy. Yes. We ain't Greek. We can't say it the way the Greeks do. <laughs> I apologize, Greeks. But it's a gorgeous room. Then you have the Oval Room, 
It is a beautifully, very distinctive elliptical shape. It's a home to a rich collection of rare books, including books printed before 1501, which have a special name. Do you know what that name is? Incunubula. Incunubula. See, I didn't want to say it because I thought I wasn't going to say it right, and I wasn't. Say no, it again. It, incunubula. Incunubula. And what it means is it's, some, it's not a scroll. It's in book form, but it's made on parchment and hand copied. That is what that is. Mm. There are several here in the reserve library here in Toulouse, and I've actually had the privilege of seeing two or three of them and touching them. With gloves, with gloves, but... Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that's a, it's a special word. It means exactly that. So, so I love that room. That's the one where I could have spent twice the time because they have a lot of printed materials that are really interesting, including music. So they have like, I saw the first print, well, the first handwritten version of La Marseillaise. And it's beautiful. They, did, they do some pictures. They have kind of a basic score that just has the tune, really. And then they have all the verses and that. It's just really well done. I also saw an original written Rite of Spring, which I thought was just marvelous. Anyway, they have a lot of original pieces of music like that. If you like music, and not just music, but many other things, that's just what caught my eye. But there's so many things. It's a, just a beautiful place. So if you go to Paris, I really highly recommend you reserve a couple of hours for the BNF because... It's right in the middle of everything. And you, if you love books, you will love it. And it's also a big deal. I mean, when it reopened, there was a big deal about it because it is the building itself is considered to be a masterpiece of 17th century architecture with its decoration and everything else, which is why it took so long to renovate and be put back in its form that it is in now. Yeah. Right. So when they renovated, it was closed for 12 years. When they renovate a place like this, it usually takes a decade or so. And they are about to start the renovation of the Pompidou Museum. So if you want to see that, go soon. It's going to close. And they say it's going to be for five years. I don't believe them. No, <laughs> it, it never is. But then again, we're talking about a building that is only 50 something years old compared to something that was 350 years old. That is true. Good point. Yes. So, so when they closed it for renovation, it was still open. Like the collections were available for the researchers. But you couldn't just sit in there. But now they can. I can't. Oh, well. It's interesting that they have made it so that it is available for people to admire and come in. And there's a cafe and everything else. So they want people to come. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's very nice. And they do have lots of guided tours. I'm sure they have some in English. It's just that they get sold out very quickly. So, yeah, yeah. Keep an eye on it if you want to do that. And the last one on my little list, because I know I think you have a couple to add, is the Saint Geneviève Library, which is very special because it is a public and university library. It is the university library of the entire system of the University of Paris. But historically, it is the most ancient of all of these because it was based on a collection that began a long time ago. And I'll back up and do a little bit of that history in a few minutes. It is across the street from the Pantheon. It is at the Place du Pantheon. Right. So if you're facing the Pantheon, it's on the left. It's right on your left. It is called saint Genevieve because as some of you may already know who've been up in that area, we have the Church of saint Genevieve, the Hill of saint Genevieve. In the Pantheon, we have the mural that tells the story of saint Geneviève, who saved Paris from the Huns. And Attila the Hun, right? Yeah. And so this is a fabulous. It is technically a university library, but it is indeed also open to the public. Some of the rooms are open to the public. And it houses a massive collection of over two million volumes. Right. So I walked past this a lot when I was writing my Latin Quarter tour. So every morning I would go, you know, at least spend an hour in that area. And there's often a line. And sometimes, and it's clearly students who are waiting in line. I don't know what they're queuing for, really, but there's usually a couple hundred people in front of there. And I haven't tried to go inside because the line looks horrible. <laughs> so I just didn't, I never tried. But if it's open to the public, perhaps you can go in. You know. can go in. I mean, I, I read that you actually, you can go in. And if I understand correctly, and it may be, it may not be correct. If you have a 
public library card from Paris, you can actually have access to some of the books. But right. because it's not necessarily a research library. It is a real library. I mean, it is a, in the sense of a lending library as well as a research library. Right. So the city of Paris also has several other libraries. And I was able to get a card, public library card for Paris. All you need is a proof of address and you don't have to live in Paris to get it. I don't know if you have to live in France, but my address is in France. So I just use that. I don't know. And a lot of these libraries, like there's one near the Carnavale Museum. I can't remember what it's called. You're not talking about the archival library. Jeez. It's in another it gorgeous archi- 17th century mansion. Yeah. Perhaps it's Les Archives. Anyway, there's one that does postcards and graphic arts. But that one, again, there's a section of it where you actually have computers and things where you can search for items. I went in there several times because I needed an original postcard from Paris when I was writing my Marais tour. I didn't end up using it, but I went back several times. And once you have a library card, you make an appointment and they can actually give you a seat. And somebody will come and bring you what you ask for, which is very nice. It's very civilized. And there's also a small section there that you can walk through and look at some of the items that you can actually browse through. And if I'm not mistaken, there's also sometimes a temporary exhibit there in a small wing of the building. It's possible. I think it's the Archival Library of Paris. That's probably it. it. I think it is. Hotel de Sens also has a library in it and you can also go in. That's at the start of my Marais walk. It's by Pont Marie, not far from there. And I've been in there. It's beautiful. You know, it's a beautiful building. So a lot of these places, you can actually go in just to see the library. There's always security of some sort. And there's restricted hours, obviously. But a lot of these places are public libraries and you can go in. And usually you cannot, again, go in with your laptop and sit there, you know, and work or read or whatever. They don't let you. But you can go in and take a look. So let's talk about the history of these libraries. How old are they? Have they been here forever? Well, libraries, it turns out, and of course, you know me. And once I start peeling back the layers, I wind up, I don't know when I'm going to stop. But this was really fascinating and so much fun. So it turns out that libraries really go back as far as writing. Let's just That's it. I mean, the first person who started writing, carving on a piece of stone, This is Flintstone stuff, you know. I mean, they went, I like this. I'm going to have two or more. And then where am I going to put them? I'm going to put them on this shelf over here, you know. Let's carve up a couple more stones. There is proof, in fact, that the collections, I mean, basically, what's the, what is a library? When you think about it, I was, you know, we were talking about the double entendre, the false friend with English, you know, library and librairie. But basically, the idea of a library is a collection. That's really what it is. It's a collection. It's a collection of documents, mostly, that begin with the history of writing. So just leaving aside from the rest of the planet, because there's a lot of stuff that has to do with other parts of the world. I found this quote that's from Seneca, and who was, you know, was a writer and uh, I believe a politician during the Roman uh, Republic. And uh, now this is a quote, I'm taking the quote as is, because I don't really read Latin and I would not know how accurate it is. But I find this amazing because we're talking now about uh, a little bit over 2,000 years ago. And he is quoted as saying that even ne'er-do-wells, what I'm translating, what basically he says, people with the nouveau riche, you know, it's like a way of showing off their money is by having a collection of scrolls in their house. It's the same thing as having hot water and having a bathroom. I mean, this we're talking about over 2,000 years ago, okay? So... You know, forget your Maserati in the garage. I mean, starting way back when, one of the ways of showing that you were wealthy and had certain prestige was by collecting manuscripts, texts, documents. I don't want to use the word book because book is really a word that really defines something made of paper with a binding, you know. And before that, we had scrolls, you know. I mean, and then from scrolls, we went to the parchment that was sewn together, you know, and things like that. But it it is amazing to me that ever since the beginning of really what we could call the written word, there have been people who wanted to make a collection. Maybe that's just a human thing to want to collect things. Sure. Makes sense to me. I mean, and it makes sense that it's, I mean, a lot of these are beautiful. So they're beautiful. Yes. You know, you're absolutely right. 
Now, of course, you know, there are mythical libraries. The Alexandrian Library in Egypt apparently was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And there was apparently an absolutely magnificent library in Constantinople founded by Constantine, who was the emperor of Eastern Christian world. But in France, let's immediately skip to France. The first recorded library is by the king named Clovis. Yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> he was king in the 500s. Yeah, that's a long time ago. And, you know, it's like, no, I haven't met him on the metro. Thank you very much. You know, yeah. he was the Frankish king who was the first one to convert to Christianity. Right. And, and what's really interesting, because I really don't know in terms of like Roman times, Greek times, I don't believe it was quite like that. But starting with the advent of Christianity, most of the texts that were considered to be precious were religious. So they were handwritten, of course, by scribes and what was called the scriptoria, which is simply the pearl of scriptorium. And the scriptorium was uh, the place inside a monastery where you had monks who would very carefully and slowly and painstakingly make a copy, which of course at first for several hundred years was strictly in Latin, of a biblical text. And it turns out that it took a monk about six months to do one. Right. Now, one of those big scriptoria was at the Mont Saint-Michel, it turned out. And nowadays, if you want to see some of these illuminated books that they copied at the Mont Saint-Michel, you have to go to Avranches, which is not very far. They have a very nice museum that shows some of these old illuminations. So, so if you're in the Mont Saint-Michel area and you want a little culture, that's where you get it. Avranche. There's a wonderful movie that has nothing to do with France called In the Name of the Rose with Sean Connery that is actually a thriller that takes place in a scriptorium in a monastery. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's yeah. really cool. It's really cool because you see them working on it. And of course, there's intrigue and all of that stuff. It happens that Albi, our Cher Albi, which is, of course, the city near us in Toulouse, began as a scriptorium. There you go. There you go. Which meant that they had a lot of people who knew how to read and write, which was not the case for most people in the early part of the Middle Ages. Right, because to copy a book efficiently and well, you have to understand the words. Exactly. I mean, it's just not, it's not just a visual copy. You have to know the words and pick up if there's any mistakes. That's right. In fact, in the earliest part of the Middle Ages, that, you know, which lasted really for quite a few hundred years, unfortunately, the majority of the people who knew how to read and write were, in fact, in monasteries, not even necessarily the kings and princes. Some of them did, and some of them did not. And books were so precious that they were attached by a chain to a table or a wall that could not be moved. I mean, this is, we're talking about scrolls and then the Inca Nubira, you know, when they were in parchment. And if somebody was caught stealing one, which you know, I mean, monks were not always angels and they sometimes took things to go from one monastery to another. Perhaps, yes. If you got caught stealing a book, you were excommunicated. Oh, that's bad. Huh? Okay, out there, be careful about your books, everybody. So this is like the Apple Store, where they have the, you know, they have those long cables to keep people from taking the stuff. Absolutely. So Clovis, believe it or not, he created the first library. He is credited with creating the very first library. He was literate and he wanted to have something that was prestigious. It's fascinating that it, prestige is really connected to the idea of a book, of a text. And he made that at the Abbey of Saint Genevieve, which is why we have the Library of Saint Genevieve, why we have the Pantheon, where we have the church. Whoa, 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 whoa. We go All back that, off yes, 1,500 yeah. years, yeah. right? And his famous library, okay, 225 manuscripts at the time was considered to be huge as a yeah, number. Yeah, in the 500s, that's a lot, yeah. For France, it is. Perhaps the Chinese already had more. I don't know. They were the, I mean, they invented paper before we did, but we'll leave the Chinese. Yeah, we don't know enough about that. Yeah, we to don't talk know about, about it. it. Skip a whole lot of centuries into the 1100s at a time when 
there are more people who are reading and writing and able to deal with literacy. And there were scriptoria all over France. And so there were more and more books being copied, specifically Bibles, literary texts, uh, biblical texts, and also the texts of the ancients. And the ancients, of course, meant Aristotle and Plato, the Greeks, because, of course, most of this was in Greek and Latin anyway. If you didn't know how to read Greek and Latin, it didn't make much difference. You know, tough, tough, out of luck, right? Yeah. The Library of the University of Paris, which was created in the 1200s, was, for a certain amount of time, the most famous and important in all of Western Europe. So we're talking about the Sorbonne and the buildings around the Sorbonne that were all created at the very beginning of the 1200s. And they had a collection of several hundred works. People were bringing works from other countries. So this was the beginning of the idea of a collection that included works that were not just in Latin or in vernacular, which meant French, but in German, in other languages as well. I mean, there were more scholars and more ecclesiastics that traveled from one country to another, from one empire to the other. And they started bringing books to make what became an extremely, extremely precious collection. And this is the beginning in this is well before even the Gutenberg press, the idea of actually making a press. But this was the beginning of not just scrolls, but the canubula, which is really binding pieces of parchment together into what really is a book form. You know, So it's interesting that the library of the University of Paris has been that important to prestigious for the last 800 years. Yeah. It's really quite amazing. And then we get to a king whom I really didn't know that much about, except that I knew that he had a bit of a problem at the end of his reign and got stuck in the Chateau of Vincennes. Um, but that is Charles V, who was a member of a dynasty called the Valois. And it turns out that good old Charles V, who lived in the middle of the 1300s, was literate and was the first person as king to decide that he wanted to create a collection of books and have a special room. And he lived mostly in the Louvre. He lived a little bit in what is now the conciergerie, but he lived mostly in the Louvre. Of course, this is still a time when the kings moved around a lot, that we were not yet settled in Versailles or in one specific place. But he was such a book lover and, of course, was able to read. But he also did something that was really interesting. He asked some of the scribes to write books in French, not just in Latin. That's interesting. Yeah. Why? And, well, he wanted his subjects to have access to them. So it turns out that he was really a very interesting king because he had some very interesting social ideas. He didn't want to leave the power of the word in the hands of just the church. He wanted to have secular knowledge and that it would be open to, obviously at this point, it would have to be a certain amount of the aristocracy or the nobility. But he insisted that some of the text be translated into French so that his subjects could read them. Interesting. So people could just show up at court and read? Well, apparently those nobles who were able to read could come Interesting. and get permission to use the texts in his library. And uh, so he is really cr credited with being the first person to create what would be called a royal library which of course is the foundation for the extensive libraries and the collections that came well afterwards. There are apparently approximately 15 of the books that were in his collection that are still in existence and that are in the Mitterrand library. I don't know if they ever put any of them on display, but it would sort of be neat to kind of see one or two of them, you know, yeah, would be. especially in ancient French as opposed to Latin. Latin, I wouldn't get a, I wouldn't have a clue. So it wouldn't make any difference, you know. Yeah. And then we get to Francois I. Why do I like Francois I? Well, you have to understand, Francois I was the king in the 1500s who brought the Renaissance to France. He brought Leonardo da Vinci to France. He created all kinds of wonderful things. And he was also a book lover. He was extremely cultivated. He was extremely well-read, well-educated. And since by this time, the printing press had been invented, he decided that what he was going to do was he was going to make a law. He was going to create an enormous, enormous, enormous library because the concept of library had now really become something very important. And of course, they were all referring back to ancient history and, and the ancients and all of this. And he lived most of the time in the Chateau of Blois in the Loire Valley. 
Although, of course, he had Fontainebleau and he did move around a lot. And so he created a law called the Dépôt Légal. And it's fascinating to know because it's basically the equivalent of what we now have in the States, which is where the Library of Congress has a copy of every single thing that's been put into print. He made it a law. He was king. He could do what he wanted, obviously. He made a law that said that every printer, any place that created a text, any kind of text, it could have been a text that is about accounting. It didn't make any difference. Anything that was a manuscript or a text of any kind had to give one copy to his library. Uh huh. And this is a law that has been in effect for 500 years. Mm-hmm. It changed a little bit at the beginning of the 1800s, but basically it still exists in one form or another, this famous law called the Dépôt Légal, which is basically like a copyright law, but it meant that every he wanted to make sure that in his library, that would be the official royal collection, there would be a copy of every single text or manuscript that was produced in France. So I published a book, but I didn't give him one. You didn't give him one. They didn't ask me either. Well, <clears throat> he's not around anymore. Right? Okay. Perhaps it doesn't work quite like that anymore. I don't, I don't know if you have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, because a lot of books are published, self-published today. Francois I would have a hard time with that, I think. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, he'd be upset. He would yeah. probably be upset. <laughs> I don't think it was a major worry about his, but, you know, he had other problems, you know. That's the 1500s. Then we have one of his descendants, and that is Louis XIV. We get a little bit further up along the line here. And what does Louis XIV do? Well, he takes the Royal Library from the Loire Valley and brings it to Paris. Why not? They were already stealing everything in Paris. Well, you know, (laughs) I mean, Louis XIV, you know, he, of course, eventually decided that he was going to give up Paris and just stay in Versailles. But at the beginning, he was in Paris and he was in the Louvre and he was not going to be outdone by his ancestor, Francois I, who had all of this fabulous collection, but that was in the Chateau Ambrois, which at the time was, you know, a little bit further away than it is now to get to. And so he actually had the collection taken and brought to the Louvre and his famous finance minister, Mr. Colbert. Ah, yes. Who was really important for many, many things. He was the one responsible for making the transfer to what became officially the Royal Library of Paris. And in 1666, a depot was created because there wasn't enough space to put all these books in the part of the Louvre that they were living in. Well, that's one of the problems. Books take up a lot of room. They always did, always will. They take up a lot of room. I'm sure a lot of these were scrolls still, and a lot of these were these old-fashioned parchment books. But what's fascinating is that, you know, the Louvre was by this time considered to be old and outdated, and they didn't live in a lot of the Louvre. They lived only in a part of it because the rest of it was just too old to live in, you know, too old, damp, and cold. And so instead of putting the books and the manuscripts in the Louvre, They created a space, and guess what? That's the Library Richelieu, the Rue Vivienne, which is really, as we both know, right? Not far. Not far, you know. That is where they made the first edition of official royal depot of books, and that is how the Richelieu Library came into being. But then they made it really lavish later. By 1719, which is already what we're we're talking at the end of the reign of Louis XIV, it is the most important collection of books in Europe. And one of the reasons why is not only do they have all these precious books and texts going back to the 400s and 500s from France, but they have made a point of collecting works from other countries as well. It's interesting that with all the other things involved, with war, with all the other things, there was an idea that having a library was prestige. Well, it still is. It still is. And it's fascinating. They hire a man, an abbot in English, we say an abbot, an abbot, a man named Abbot Bignon. Nice name. I like Bignon. I love it. He was apparently very well educated. He was, you know, part of a monastic tradition. He was hired to be the head librarian by Colbert. And he was given carte blanche. And I love that term, carte blanche. Yeah. And he was told organize this thing. Let's get this. We have here over uh, 1,200 texts and manuscripts. Who knows exactly how many they actually had. And guess what? He is the man that is responsible 
for the concept of organization that still exists in libraries to this day by category of the kind of text it is, by the date, by, you know, all of these different systems. Of course, it isn't the... Dewey Decimal. It's not quite the Dewey Decimal, but he was the equivalent of doing the Dewey Decimal at the time. He also gathered together lots of scientific texts, lots of other texts from different places, and he added to the prestige. And he is really responsible for the full organization of what became the most important library so that there were over 100 people a day. And since many of these books by this time, of course, were written in French, and there was a a big part of the population that was able to read and write, it was used by the general public. It was open to the general public. And they say that over 100 people a day had access to this library, including people such as Voltaire and Rousseau. Aha, yes. Who actually went, and since they were bookworms, spent time with their heads in the books in the Royal Library. Fantastic. And they could just go borrow books? And they could, I don't know if they could take the books out, but they... Well, probably not, but I'm that's sure fine. That they couldn't, but they were certainly able to spend their days inside the library studying things, looking at, for instance, the first encyclopedia made by Diderot, all these scientific texts and works from other languages. They both spoke other languages and read other languages as well. And so it must have been really amazing. Have no idea if women were allowed in. That would have been interesting to find out. I don't know. I don't know either, but I don't see why not. I don't see why not, since by this time we certainly have certain women who were known as literary women with writing skills. You know, in many ways, it's the 1900s that really put the screws on women. Before that, they did a lot. The women were allowed. I mean, we have all these women who had letters that were famous, you know, and writing memoirs that were famous and things like that, you know, so... Then, of course, we get to the French Revolution. Dun, dun, dun. (sighs) So what happens with the French Revolution? Well, contrary to what I thought and what I would have imagined, the Royal Library was not disbanded. The name was changed. It was the National Library all of a sudden. Okay. uh, Which is normal. Okay, 1790. And rather than destroying these books, thankfully... What the people did who were in charge of dealing with this part of the the revolution, I don't know exactly who they were, to be honest, was they took the collections of many, many, many of the nobility and the aristocrats who had private libraries, and they simply took those and added it to the national collection. There you go. That's a really good way to, that's, that's good. Do that. So there you are. So now what we have, thanks to the French Revolution, is that we have a library in the largest sense of the term that is much more accessible to a general, obviously educated population, which is clearly not a majority of the people anyway. But it has been added to by thousands of volumes, literally thousands of volumes. And apparently some of it was distributed to other cities, to other libraries that were being made, that were being made basically by taking private collections and being made into public collections, which is the case of what happened here in Toulouse. Yeah, not so good. You have bishops and you have nobility who had private collections and suddenly it's become a public collection so that other people have access to it. Yeah, I guess, I guess. That's fine. What's wrong with that? Well, but you're taking books from people. Well, you know, a bishop who keeps a collection and doesn't want other people to see it. No, I'm... Yeah, no. perhaps not. Okay. No, yeah. no, I'd rather have it be a public library, you know. It turns out that th- the library was so filled by this time with books that they obviously had to get rid of some of them, which is why they started distributing to other major cities that had beautiful palaces that were now turned into spaces that were museums or libraries because they couldn't hold all of these books. And to add to all of this, Just a few years later, we have our dear old Napoleon. Now, Mr. Napoleon. Yes. He had a very strange concept of what the world was like. His idea of the world was, if it's there, I want it. (laughs) And among the other things he wanted, besides taking Egyptian temples and Greek columns and and God knows what else, he confiscated. Oh, that's my word. Excuse me. He took as, as... Stole? Booty. Uh, He took thousands of works, thousands of works from Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Holland. And Uh, he 
brought them to Paris. Of course. As you do. You Everything do. goes to Paris, right? Yes, yes, Everything yes. Everything goes to Paris. Okay. Apparently one of the, you know, when he went on his wars, he didn't take just the soldiers. He took scientists and intellectuals and artists and, of course, people to document everything that he did. Oh, his good deeds. <laughs> everything. Absolutely everything, you know. And so somebody wrote and said, in Cologne, you know, in Germany, alone, there were 25 cases of books that were taken. And, you know, we're talking still 200 years ago when books were pretty precious. and um, There weren't that many, but they were just little paperbacks. Well, of course, this added to this enormous collection. And this is part of why by the 19th century, it is really necessary to add to the buildings that house all of these books because we can't hold them anymore. Yeah, this is, a, I, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you should see my, you should see my house, you know, it's like, I, I have cracks, your house. <laughs> cracks in the walls, the building. Yes, you know, it's terrible. When you like books, it's really awful. Anyway, so we get to the middle of the 1800s and then you have Mr. Labrouste, the famous architect who has been hired and this is interestingly by his nephew, Napoleon III, the people's emperor. The people's emperor, okay. The people's emperor, which is what he called himself, right? And he is the one who hired Labrouste to reconstruct parts of the buildings that were being used to house these enormous collections. Because, of course, by this time it was no longer in the Louvre, which was just this damp, funky old castle. But I mean, honestly, Paris, without Napoleon III and the lavish spending that he did on a lot of these buildings, like, you know, the Opera House and the BNF and places like that. Paris would not be Paris. No, Paris would not be Paris. Yeah, yeah. It really. And he hired a man named Leopold de Lille. And Leopold de Lille created the first general catalog of printed books that was an exhaustive list of everything that had been printed since the beginning of the Depot Legal by Francois I. So this is a great idea, but it's a futile attempt to, you cannot catalog everything. I mean, it's perhaps AI will catalog everything for us, but humans were not that, you know. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, he we, tried, he tried. Believe it or not, there was a list made. It was revised every single year from 1874 through to 1981. So that's a big deal. You know, you need to keep your list updated. You have to make an effort all the time. Otherwise, you're lost. Like, it's gone. It's no good anymore. Yeah. And then, of course, since then, it's been more or less computerized, you know. But can you imagine they've done, they did this every single year from 1874 to 1981. That is almost 100 years. No, it's mm -hmm. more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. What am I saying? It's more than 100 yeah. years. You know, it's really quite amazing. Anyway, all of this to say that the National Library of France, which is really the National Library of Paris, became known through all this time as the most important library in Europe. And, right. You know, we have people like Victor Hugo who add, who gave it as a legacy, all of his handwritten manuscripts. You have the Duke of Chantilly, we were, when we visited Chantilly, who left a huge part of his collection of works to the, the National Library. And it went back and forth because of the 19th century between being called the National Library, a Royal Library, an Imperial Library. But basically, it was all one and the same thing. It is what it is. And all of this pretty much stayed in the relatively, let's say, old-fashioned buildings because they were, of course, added to and modernized a bit by La Brousse and all of that. But it really wasn't until we get to François Mitterrand in the 1980s, which is really now, what, 40-something years ago, who realizes, I think, first of all, that he wanted to have something that would be a monument in his honor that would be left afterwards for posterity. Sure. But basically what happened was, by the beginning and the middle of the 20th century, there are over 20-something million texts and documents that are, have been collected, that are placed in all these various buildings and structures. And so he finally decided that it would be his life's project to create a new, brand new, huge library. And that project was begun right after he took office in 1981 and, of course, was not finished until 1996. And that is, of course, the BNF François Mitterrand that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast. The name of the architect is Dominique Perrault, like man who wrote the fairy tales in the 19th century. It's in the shape of four book ends 
But around. you already told us that. I know. I know. But it is really, a lot of people hate it. They think it's really ugly. You know, they think it, it should have been something more aesthetic. But I think it's because there are lots of people who like the Richelieu and the Mazarin anyway. But just a few more statistics. We already mentioned the fact that it's 22 floors high. There are 400 kilometers, linear kilometers of book stacks. That's a lot. Yeah. That, that's a fair amount. Okay. The stockage space is, and I'm going to, I translated it into square feet just because some people really do understand that. Not that I do, but 513,000 square feet. The lecture rooms, the lecture rooms, because there are 11 lecture rooms in the Mitterrand Library, 486,000 square feet. It's a lot of space, huh? Yeah. And the garden is a little over two acres in the center, and it is considered to be one of the largest buildings to hold text, monuments, artifacts, etc. in the world. Wow. So we need to conclude, at least because we've been talking a very long time. Well, that's really where we are. I mean, we've reopened the Richelieu. We have the Francois Mitterrand Library, and we have books, 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 and that is what Paris and France is all about. And, you know, I want to express my appreciation for authors and librarians and libraries because I have spent a lot of time, especially as a young person, going to various libraries, whether they were in a bus, bibliobust, which I went to a lot as a kid, or the more beautiful buildings. It doesn't matter. They all hold these wonderful things called books that tell stories and, yeah. and collect knowledge. And I think they are wonderful. And I think librarians are underestimated. They yes. can really change a life. And I just wanted to add just one last little tidbit that's very personal. And what I was doing notes for this, I was thinking about my mom who loved to read, but who never growing up had any money and who spent her life using a public library. Of course. Yeah, that's what you do. But I mean, honestly, if you had to buy every book you wanted to read, you probably wouldn't read very much because, you know, it's just even people who have money, there's only so much you can spend on books and so many books you can store at home. So libraries are perfect. That's what they're for. That's what they're for. Thank you so much, Elise. Thank you, Annie. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for giving back and supporting this show. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing that. I try to release one new reward every week. And you can see all of that at patreon.com for a slash join us. Thank you all for supporting the show. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Daniil Benecki and Sean Rapp. Now, the extra for patrons that I released this week is an episode I recorded with Susan and Ron Crump that was about their wonderful bike trip in France. And as it turns out, we talked about that with patrons this month. So I decided I should pre-release this interview to my patrons. Now, the main podcast feed that you're listening to right now is audio only. But since I record on Zoom, I will occasionally pre-release an episode to patrons and that will include video so you can see the lovely people I'm talking to. I also released video recordings of my Zoom meetings with the patrons. If you missed it, you can watch the reruns. To enjoy this wonderful community of Francophiles, go to patreon.com for slash join us. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes. And to support Elise, go to patreon.com for slash Elise Art. E-L-Y-S-A-R-T. My thanks also to Sasha Cohen and Sabatino Pulgini for their one-time donation using any button on Join Us in France that says, Tip your guide. Much appreciated. Sabatino wrote, Thank you for your amazing work. I've booked another trip to France because of your podcast. <laughs> I apologize. Is that good or is that bad? I don't know. I think it's good. <laughs> Merci beaucoup to both of you. And of course, you can hire me to be your personal itinerary consultant. I offer either the Bonjour or the VIP service. And to look at the details, go to joinusinfrance.com for slash boutique, and then you'll get some emails uh, to guide you through the process. You can also take me in your pocket with my voice map, GPS guided tours, 
Uh, you can take me along to the Eiffel Tower, the Ile de la Cité, Le Marais, Montmartre, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, or the Latin Quarter, and I guarantee you will see the very best of those neighborhoods like you've done this your whole life because you'll be following me along. You can access my tours directly from the Voice Map app if you're in a hurry, but you can also purchase tour codes at a discount from joinusinfrance.com for slash boutique and you'll receive the special listener discount. But if you get the discount, you won't get the codes immediately. It's not automated. It's a person actually sending you the codes. All right, let's talk a little bit about the opening ceremony for the Paris Olympics. Now, that ceremony is going to take place on July 26, 2024. Traditionally, the opening ceremony is held in the Olympic Stadium, right? But in Paris, this ceremony will make history by taking place on the Seine River, the river that flows through Paris. So the scene for the Olympics opening ceremonies will be the Seine. How very clever. <laughs> So the parade of athletes, which traditionally takes place within a stadium, will be held on the river with boats for each national delegation equipped with cameras to allow viewers watching on TV and online to get a close-up view of all the action. The boats will depart from Pont d'Austerlitz near the Jardin des Plantes and will end by the Trocadero and the Eiffel Tower. This is nearly six kilometers of route along the river. The whole area will need to be secured, but only some sections will require a ticket to get access. Regular folks, like me, without Olympic tickets, like me, will be able to line the bridges and the banks of the river to enjoy the procession for free. To me, that's wonderful news. I'll link an article about this in the show notes, and it, it'll contain a rendering of what they have in mind. But imagine colorful boats with the best athletes in the world waving, the people cheering all along. I think it's going to be very grand. And French people do know how to put on a fantastic outdoor show. But there is controversy as well. Some folks are harping on about the poor, poor bouquinistes who are going to have to move during the Olympics. So the bouquinistes are people who have set up the little, well, they're not so little, the green boxes, they're wooden boxes in which they store trinkets or books or postcards or whatever it is that they sell. And they occupy a lot of space along the river in very strategic parts of the banks of the river. And these people are having to move during the Olympics. And the New York Times, for some reason, decided to make that their cause célèbre. And uh, they've been talking about that and making everybody feel terrible for these poor, maybe 50 people <laughs> who have owned these uh, franchises for a long, long time. Now, Honestly, I'm not all that sad about it because they will be moved temporarily. They will be compensated. They will be set up to sell somewhere else, and then they will be moved back. This is the people's river. The sidewalk does not belong to the bouquinist. So if for security reasons and access reasons, they need to be moved, so be it. I'm sure they'll make out like bandits like they always have. A bigger problem is the no hijab rule in France. It's going to apply to the athletes as well. Personally, I think women should be allowed to cover their hair if they want to, but I'm in a tiny, tiny minority of French people who think like that. So that's how it's going to be. If you want to be in the Olympics in France, you cannot wear a hijab. Our house, our rules, I guess. But I wish it weren't so. And I know it will be very controversial. Hopefully, it'll be France's opportunity to see how much we are at odds with the rest of the world when it comes to this. But as French people like to point out, and I think they're right, 
just 50, 70 years ago, the hijab was also not allowed in Iran or in Turkey or in many places where the major religion is Muslim. So the rise of a certain flavor of Islam forced women to cover up. Now, were they forced to cover up or were they finally allowed to cover up? Well, that's a political question and I do what I can to stay away from politics. But I do know that this is going to be controversial and for good reason. My thanks to podcast editors Anne and Christian Cotovan who produce this audio and the transcripts. Next week on the podcast, an episode about medieval touring in France with Matthew Gamache, who is a returning guest and always a treat to hear from. Oh, and I should say briefly that I am almost all the way better from my bout of COVID, my very first bout of COVID, after four doses of vaccine and Paxlovid. It didn't stand much of a chance, but I must admit it was scary there for a few days. So hooray for science and hooray for doctors. My husband and I are very lucky. We have a very good doctor who just said, look, you're at risk. Let's give you the Paxlovid. And it works. It really works. It gives you a terrible taste in your mouth, but it really works. The taste does go, go away, though. I, it's gone. I, the metal taste in my mouth, done. Thank God. Thank you for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2023 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.